know when you have that dream and you go ass over tit on the way to the stage? It wasn't a dream. Marcus, I need your book, because I was trying to work out, and I'm seventh, but how many speakers have there been? And I couldn't, I couldn't do the sums. Um, I want to get in under, under seven minutes in the tinkling glass, so I'm going to... Uh, if you're curious about who I am, just Google me. I'm not Chris Power, the UK's foremost close-up magician. I'm the other one. Um, so uh, my story of hope is, uh, is about the death of a, of a tubercular, tubercular soldier. Um, I'm going to read the last couple of pages by, uh, of a story by Chekhov um, that has the tiniest print on earth, this book, so we'll see how that goes. But um, I don't know that I read many things that are hopeful, um, and perhaps that's a sign of my privilege and, and luck in life, that I don't require comfort from reading. Um, but when I think about it, hope is something that Chekhov gives me more than any other writer. Um, and he based this story that I'm going to read from, uh, which is called Gusev, on events that he witnessed on a long voyage back from the prison island of um, Sakhalin. I should have talked to Oliver beforehand about pronunciation. I'm going to afterwards. The conditions Chekhov found on this prison island like, appalled him. Um, and he wrote a book about it. He wrote a non-fiction book, which brought it to the attention of the Russian people and contributed to a drive to, to change penal conditions there and, and throughout Siberia as well. Um, but I want to read this particular passage tonight because, in part because it demonstrates what fiction can do, specifically fiction, to our, to our brains and to our hearts, where it can take us. But also because at the end of this story, Chekhov goes beyond the human. It's a very, it's a very humane story, um, but nevertheless he goes beyond the human at the end of it, which is what I'm really interested in. And if I was standing here as a teacher, I might talk about... Um, you know how the end of the story engages with pathetic fallacy and the ocean scowls and so on like that. But that doesn't really get at what Chekhov's doing. I think he takes the story to a point where he steps back and he says something's happening in this moment, something incredible, but it's beyond the capacity of you or I to understand it. It isn't even our place to understand it. And I haven't always read Gusev this way, but, but now I think about it in relation to the, the problems that the world faces. Um, you know, consider the now or never ultimatum that the IPCC issued this week about securing a low carbon economy. Um, think about the mess of an energy strategy that the government just unveiled. And it seems to me that if there is to be hope, then we need to acknowledge what's happening to our planet and acknowledge that the, the anthropocentric model perhaps isn't the best one, that the human shouldn't always be the default POV. So here's something from 1890 that, that makes that point. Gusev goes back to the sick bay and gets in his bunk. Some vague urge still disturbs him. But what it is he wants, he just can't reckon. His chest feels tight his head's pounding, and his mouth so parched he can hardly move his tongue. He dozes and rambles. Tormented by nightmares, cough and sweltering atmosphere, he falls fast asleep by morning. He dreams that they have just taken the bread out of the oven in his barracks. He has climbed into the stove himself and is having a steam bath, lashing himself with a birch switch. He sleeps for two days. At noon on the third, Two soldiers come down and carry him out of the sick bay. They sew him up in a sailcloth and put in two iron bars to weigh him down. Sewn in canvas, he looks like a carrot or radish, broad at the head and narrow at the base. They carry him on deck before sundown and place him on a plank. One end of the plank rests on the ship's rail and the other on a box set on a stool. Heads bare, Discharged soldiers and crew stand by. Blessed is the Lord's name, begins the priest, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Amen, chant the three sailors. Soldiers and crew cross themselves, glancing sideways at the waves. Strange that a man has been sewn into that sailcloth and will shortly fly into those waves. Could that really happen to any of them? The priest scatters earth over Gusev and makes an obeisance. Eternal memory is sung. The officer of the watch tilts one end of the plank. Gusev slides down it, 
flies off headfirst, does a somersault in the air, and in he splashes. Foam envelops him, and he seems swathed in lace for a second, but the second passes, and he vanishes beneath the waves. He moves swiftly towards the bottom. Will he reach it? It is said to be three miles down. He sinks eight or nine fathoms, then begins to move more and more slowly, swaying rhythmically as if trying to make up his mind. Caught by a current, he is swept sideways more swiftly than downwards. Now he meets a shoal of little pilot fish. Seeing the dark body, the fish stop dead. Suddenly all turn tail at once and vanish. Less than a minute later, they again pounce on Gusev like arrows and stitch the water around him with zigzags. Then another dark hulk looms, a shark. Ponderous, reluctant, and apparently ignoring Gusev, it glides under him and he sinks onto its back. Then it turns belly upwards, basking in the warm, translucent water and languidly opening its jaw with the two rows of fangs. The pilot fish are delighted, waiting to see what will happen next. After playing with the body, the shark nonchalantly puts its jaws underneath, cautiously probing with its fangs, and the sailcloth tears along the body's whole length from head to foot. One iron bar falls out, scares the pilot fish, hits the shark on the flank, and goes swiftly to the bottom. Overhead, meanwhile, clouds are massing on the sunset side, one like a triumphal arch, another like a lion, a third like a pair of scissors. From the clouds, a broad green shaft of light breaks through, spanning out to the sky's very center. A little later, a violet ray settles alongside, then a gold one by that, and then a pink one. The sky turns a delicate mauve. Gazing at this sky, so glorious and magical, the ocean, the ocean scowls at first, but soon it too takes on tender, joyous, ardent hues for which human speech hardly has a name. Thank you.